And I'm going to talk to you about uh, the, medi the medieval towns in the Low Countries and the trajectories towards the medieval urban life that is uh, so well known and valued in the Low Countries, uh, from a touristic point of view, at least before Brussels. Um, and we are going to look into the trajectories of these towns uh, into a reverse perspective. We begin with uh, the most recent phases and we go back into time. Let's see how this works. Yes, the, re the times of the Low Countries were um, the issue of huge debates um, by Piren, Hodges, Verhulst, Lebec and so on. And I'm not going into that debate, uh, those debates themselves, that would uh, cost me 15 minutes in itself. But we can say that uh, one of the dangers of, of, of these larger debates is that they, re they, they tend to reduce phenomena into historical categories or anthropological categories too much and they are, well, only Richard Hodges was a proper archaeologist of course, the other, uh, yeah, Joachim Hennings as well, but he wrote less about it. But historians tend to, to reduce uh, a little bit too much, I fear, so we have to look at the phenomena themselves in their proper context, what is urban and when is it urban and, and so on. I uh, like the Susan Reynolds description of what is a town or what is urban. This is uh, according uh, to her text from 2000. It's a permanent settlement. Uh, it can be tempor temporary, but then there is a degree of permanence. It's a concentrated uh, settlement. There is a significant non-agricultural occupation um, and they are different. They are different sort of people, especially compared to the rural people, and they have different conceptions of time, especially time is different in a time compared to uh, on, on a farm, of course. Um, and the way I want to look at the times is looking at their life trajectories. And life tra trajectories mean that there is always a selection. There is a form, and a form can change uh, in different contexts, and as time goes on, uh, the form can age, or form can disappear or can be preserved or not or can get, uh, be innovated or restorated etc etc. Uh, if you look at this, uh, the, this view of Ghent, um, Ghent is the largest medieval town north of the Alps uh, in the late medieval period. Only one building is 12th century of this so-called um, homogeneous view of the late medieval port. This is a 15th century building, this is a 19th century building, and even the bridge is uh, 19th century. So this is an amalgam of a lot of different uh, strategies and phenomena. The towns, the late medieval towns in the Low Countries could be described, like Felix Biermann does, as forum towns, because central is the big forum, the market square, which has a uh, for late medieval historians a huge symbolic significance. Um, they play an important role in the late medieval long distance trade. They are known for their large symbols, the walls, the markets, the halls, it's, uh, also the churches. But what we know is that um, the formation of that typical urban fabric for, uh, happens between the middle of the 12th and the middle of the 13th century only. And before, uh, so before 1250, these towns look entirely different. Um, the development of that typical urban fabric also goes along with um, the development of the power of the merchants. We know that the merchants take power uh, in the cities like in Italy and, and, and rule the cities uh, between the 13th and 16th century before absolute, absolute power, absolute, absolutistic rulers come into position. This is Ghent, uh, just to show you how large these towns are and how impressive. Um, in Ghent you have the Friday Mark, just as an example. This is the largest town square, but excavations have shown that uh, it's only there from the early 13th century and it's, um, it's created on top of several 10th to 12th century deposits, buildings, uh, waste deposits of, uh, uh, amongst others, red painted wares. So, so we have to be careful uh, 
with giving too much significance to this place in the long-term development of, of, of these towns. And this is Bruges uh, and its most important late medieval buildings, but you will see that none of them actually existed before the 13th century. What did exist in Bruges or how Bruges uh, looked before the 13th century was, was, uh, was like this. When you see it on a map, uh, down there, maybe with the arrow, you have a central fortress, it's called the Burg. The Burg is from the middle of the 10th century and uh, the first markets in Bruges originate um, next to the gates of the fortress as so-called Suburbia. Uh, Suburbia and it's probably the count of Flanders that uh, organized trade even and brought or, or stimulated merchants um, to, to bring products there, to, to organize craftsmanship, to organize trade and so on. But the, 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 the center of everything is a, is a princely palace, a palace of the 10th century with even a copy of the, of the Aachen Minster, meaning that the Count of Flanders had uh, some ambitions. Uh, before 1200, by the way, this large building, which is the, 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 the stone, the donjon of the, uh, not really a donjon, but it's called, called the stone tower of the, of the Count, was the only significant uh, civilian building in the entire town and uh, it was also a feared building because uh, executions um, in that time uh, consisted of throwing people from that tower. Um, this is another example, I'll just present it briefly. Um, this is a small town, we also have small towns uh, in Lier, and uh, you see the same thing. You see an entire late medieval development with a marketplace, but actually the origin of the town is an oppidum, a fortress uh, from the 11th, 12th century with a church that is situated in the red uh, circle, and the older origin is even outside the, the city. It's an old estate center called Old Lier. Um, and over there the micromorphological research is very important as well as uh, Barbara has shown just a quick look at um, her work on the market square uh, and when you look into the micro stratigraphy of the place then you see that it starts with a very nice symbolic market square with a stone uh, building stone, but uh, when you go back into time you end with a rural meadow and wasteland where flax was cultivated. In Ghent, the same thing uh, seems to happen. Um, we go back to the early medieval Ghent in a minute, but in the 10th, 12th century, Ghent is just like Bruges, a kind of fortress town with a palace uh, construction, uh, the Gravenkasteel that you see uh, left on top, and all the markets are situated at the entries of the roads leading to the Grave Castel, and also in Ghent it seems clear that the feudal lord, the Count of Flanders, stimulated the merchant activity and stimulated also merchant emancipation. We could even, even say, I think, that in that period, in the 10th, 12th century, something cannot become a permanent town, there is no urban development if there is no lord supporting it. And that's also shown by the example Peter Jan gave with the example of Domburg, where there was apparently no lordly um, involvement, so Domburg disappeared. There was lordly involvement in Middelburg uh, with the Minster Church and everything, so, Minster, uh, so Middelburg uh, stayed. And what before the 10th century? Well, then we see a real big variety of settlements with convergent and divergent patterns. It's really hard to get uh, to, to see to see if there's some uh, common ground there. It's, it's, it's one of the big questions there. Uh, when we look at uh, that other large town, Antwerp, which was the largest town in the world in the 16th century, uh, only then, um, <laughs> then, then you see there in the red circle the core, which is the D-shaped core of the town. And that was the place where excavations took place in the 1950s, 1960s, and also in 2008 and 2009. And also in la two years ago, some extra excavations were done in the neighborhood. And uh, we see a wooden, a wooden town, a, uh, a wooden, a long pier to, to follow the Irish example, but 
that's a little bit uh, varying. I mean, we cannot really compare it, of course. Uh, it's, co it's comparable to what Sven showed in uh, Dubai, but it's a wooden town that exists there between 850 and 950, that's what C14 tells us, and it's never mentioned in the written sources. Uh, it becomes an Ottomanian fortress only at the end of the 10th century. So uh, we have this remarkable, remarkable pre-feudal urban town. It resembles Scandinavian towns. Uh, it is involved in long distance trade, but the origin and the context of its origin are actually not very well known. It's, 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 it's a strange place. Why does it originate and, and in which context does it originate? It's a kind of mysterious town. And the other thing that is strange, I go back to the previous one, is that when you look at this deposits, these are two to three meters of artisan uh, production deposits positioned on top of the wooden town. Who did this and why? And it's a very strange decision to cover the entire town with meters and meters of, of artisan production covers. So that's also something that we do not understand. Um, Antwerp became eventually a town because of the Ottonian involvement, but over here we have a, a communal Turk settlement in Leffingen uh, in the coastal plain where we uh, excavated the last two years. It's a Turk mound like in Friesland and it has the same features as Antwerp in more or less the same time. You see the World War I photo of Leffingen, we excavated at the edge of the dwelling mound, you see the, the, the dwelling mound layers, the typical Turps strat stratigraphy, and we have uh, let's, uh, about 20 ovens, metal ovens, even fibulae were produced, there is of course textile production because we're in the coastal plain. Um, and it has a lot of features that are not rural. These are not, this is not just a, an ordinary rural site. This is a central place with urban potential, but it never became urban because uh, some uh, things lacked. And then we have another phenomenon in the Low Countries, and these are the monastic sites. And there is Ghent a very nice example because we have two 7th century abbeys there, uh, 7th century abbeys that uh, are situated actually outside the present town center, which is also remarkable. The early medieval cores are outside uh, the late medieval uh, center. Um, these monastic sites, for instance, uh, the St. Baths uh, site, are not that well known from an archaeological point of view. There were some excavations, there is import material, there seem to be crafts, but we do not know enough about them. But uh, the written sources, history tells us that we can uh, situate a viki, viki of craftsmen and tradesmen next to these monasteries. And in Ghent, it's very remarkable, and that seems to uh, prove Peter Jan's point that before this became an abbey in the seventh, uh, late 7th century, it was an assembly place where Saint Amandus, who founded the abbey, had to destroy idols and uh, get rid of all the, the, the pagan assembly elements before he could start the abbey. This is the other abbey, the St. Peter's Abbey, but I will. And I'll end with Maastricht, the town where we go next year. Um, as you know, it's in Belgium. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's um, Urupstreactensis is the, the Latin name. It's a, it's a basilica town. It's a, like the town that uh, Harriet uh, talked about Tour, they, have a, they, they resemble each other. You have a Roman core and you see the Roman fortress and the bridge. Um, and then there is another basilica west of it, that's, that's the basilica that becomes the core of a kind of vicus christianorme, vicus of craftsmen and tradesmen as well. And then there's even a wick at the other side of the river. Um, and in Maastricht there is very clearly uh, a, a lot of craft production that was excavated in the 1980s and 90s, Tremesis production, ceramic production, fibula production, etc. But is this urban? That's, that's the question. Is this urban or is this just a landing place with a very prestigious basilica and all the social and ritual activities that a basilica attracts? As a conclusion, we can say for the Low Countries that what is urban is a dynamic and contextual concept and we have to look at different ages and different 
uh, in different contexts, in different times, with different perspectives in order to understand that urban phenomena or the trade that happens there. Um, there is clearly no real theological trajectory or long-term um, forced continuity, except maybe for the Basilica towns. That's the only time we can say it. there is a reason why the town is there on a very long uh, term perspective because of the Christian element. Um, the image that I showed you is uh, includes as well that we have to look at um, towns that would not make it, that didn't make it. It's also possible, uh, especially for that first millennium. And we have to look, what is important is that we have to look into the social reproduction strategies and political stimuli, like Martin Carver said in his um, Journal of Medieval Archaeology paper of 2015. It's also very clear that the feudal stimulus to merchant emancipation in the high medieval period is, is of crucial importance of what happens afterwards in the late medieval period. Um, as a final conclusion, I can say that a successful and permanent urban, urbanism will only originate when you um, give the merchant and the craftsman the opportunity to develop their own permanent concentrated settlement with their own sense of place and time to put the rural assembly in Thank you.